Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you for thank you for joining our session. Uh, please wait if this microphone stops working. Uh, thank you for joining our session, which is called "Demonization of Russia: Justified or Propaganda." Nothing controversial there. Uh, my name is Edward Baumgartner. I am co-founder of Edward Austin Limited, which is a consultancy based in London. Um, and I'm just going to read the description of the session uh, uh, as it was given to us. Uh, and we base our, our, well, our, not our presentation, but our presentation on. So, if the Western media is to be believed, Russia is an out of control country that poses a realistic threat to global stability, whether by the poisoning of dissidents, computer hacking, corruption on a grand scale, or other means. So this session aims to go beyond the hype and propaganda and seeks to determine fact versus fiction. No pressure. So I'm pleased to be joined by my uh, old friend, uh, old in the sense of for many years, not that he's old, uh, Christopher Topher Harrison, who is founder of Political Alpha, a Washington, D.C.-based consultancy. Uh, despite being conservative, he's a good guy, and he has an impressive resume, both inside and outside of government, working in the Defense Department and State uh, during the George W. Bush administration, and more recently advising financial clients on global opportunities and risk in such places as China, Russia, and the Middle East. So, for today's, today's panel, I will briefly present what I think is the origins of the situation that we're in today. Um, and then I will present sort of my view of the situation, uh, which is essentially that the demonization is unjustified, uh, and then hand it over to Topher. Uh, I want to say, however, that we have a few ground rules here. Um, the first is we want to keep the discussion as relevant as possible for you, the audience, as professionals, whether you're lawyers or investigators or law enforcement, uh, and we want to avoid what, what we, as having the misfortune of being Russian study makers, have experienced their entire lives, which is just sort of endless, bottomless, pointless discussions of Russia being a, you know, being destined to our autocracy, or that Russia is inevitably corrupt, or that Russia is this, or Russia is that. We really want to avoid um, sort of playing into any stereotypes or historical tropes and try to keep it to the, how we got to the immediate situation we're in, uh, and how we might address it as citizens, policymakers, uh, and also in our own work. So, and, and finally, I want to say to if there are any Russians in the audience, I haven't actually run into any Russians at this this um, conference yet. I want to say that if there's anything in here that feels like stereotypes or or is unfair, I, I really would it, 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 uh, urge you to to speak during the, the question and answer session, which will be extensive. Um, we don't want to make anyone responsible for the actions of their governments. I, as an American and British dual citizen, feel very strongly about that. Um, and I'm sure many of you here do as well. So if there's anything that's said that, that seems like we are you know, offending any, anyone who is Russian or indeed Ukrainian, because Ukraine comes up a lot in this discussion, I apologize in advance. And I apologize for Topher in advance, he asked me to say. So. Um, so how did we get here? I'm going to begin with a very brief outline of, of my vision of how we got here, largely because I've lived through it one way or another as a professional involved with Russia uh, and the former Soviet Union. Uh, my previous career many years ago, about 20 years ago, was working as a, uh, a, a financial PR advisor. There is such a job. Uh, we were working in London and Moscow in the early 2000s to help Russian um, companies to either working with their bankers and the companies to do euro bond issues or listings of shares on the London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. And I would say this was the great sort of kumbaya moment or the last kumbaya moment of Russian, American slash British Western relations because it was the last time I think that everyone's incentives seemed broadly aligned. Um, when, when we brought Russian companies to the market, they weren't just oil and gas companies that were working for a few small, sh you know, few shareholders of the state. They were consumer companies, they were, they, they were soft drinks, dairy, banks that had, that, that issued mortgages to ordinary people that, uh, and, and it, it seemed like a very dynamic time and, and, and there was a sense of a win-win situation. I'd say that that changed first in 2003 with 
funnily enough, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the, and the Enron scandal, because you try to convince a Russian uh, CEO or a CFO uh, or anyone who's not from the US to, to, to take criminal liability for signing accounts, they won't do it. And so they stopped listing their companies there. Uh, there's been one Russian listing that I know of in the US since, and, but that was CTC and that was an outlier because it was originally a US uh, domiciled company. So the more, the more important lasting uh, change was the Yuko scandal, um, which did a number of things. One, it just launched a very ugly PR war. And I think for a lot of us at the time, I remember coming into the office in London every day just to see what new tax judgment had been made against the Yuko shareholders. We obviously had a position because we knew a lot of the Yuko's people. We knew their IR people. We knew the, the executives. We were probably very much biased in their favor. I've learned a lot since, which has changed my views. Nonetheless, at the time, it seemed like a very deliberate government assault. And on top of that, there seemed to be evidence, again, maybe it was just rumors, that the, the Rus Russian officials were shorting Yuko's shares at, ahead of launching massive tax claims against it. Um, it also created the, be the beginning of, well, it, it created, so in the early 2000s, you had people like Guzinski and Berezovsky set up in London, but they were kind of discredited figures. When, when you had Yukos people show up in London and DC and New York, they, they were much more serious people and they had very specific claims against the Russian government that could not be easily refuted. Um, and I think that affected a lot of the media coverage of, uh, of Russia. Next is a subject dear to the heart of some of my friends in the audience here, Bill Browder. So uh, Bill Browder was somebody who I had met a few times and, and knew vaguely when he was an activist investor in Russia and was, was very friendly to the regime. But when he went through his conversion, uh, that he, he, Bill Browder, whatever you want to say about it, is an incredibly effective PR person, probably the most effective I've ever run into in my life. And the beginning of his campaign against the Russian government then, I think, marked the next stage of, if you want to call it deterioration or alienation um, of, of uh, the US, UK from, from, from Russia. Um, right around that time, we also had uh, the Litvinenko poisoning, uh, which I think was uh, shocked the conscience of any, anyone, especially a British citizen, to see you know, weapons of mass destruction being deployed in London. To, to, to kill a dissident. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think for me personally, that was, that was, a, that was almost an earth-shattering moment in my relationship uh, with Russia, and I'm sure it was for some people here. And it certainly was in terms of how the media and, and, and political actors re related to Russia uh, in the UK and to a certain degree in the US. I've actually always been astonished at how little the Litvinenko and even the Skripal poisoning affected US policymakers by comparison. Um, the case of BP is one that I think is crucial to the, what's happened today. And it's one that's, I think, a little bit forgotten. Uh, and that was the, because first of all, nobody really felt that badly for BP, especially in this, this sort of the second stage of this confrontation BP had with its Russian business partners because it happened right around the time of Deepwater Horizon. And the reservoir of sympathy for BP was absolutely zero. So, uh, but the fact that BP was, was pretty systematically dismantled by Western-leaning business people, I think some of us know who these people are. They're very litigious, so I'm not gonna get into it. Uh, some have US passports. Um, and they would do things, they allegedly, BP claims that they poisoned one of their executives, they bugged their offices, they launched, they would, they would get a sharehold, a, a made-up shareholder with one, one share to launch a billion-dollar lawsuit in, in a Siberian court nobody could find. Um, and the effect was pretty damning, I think, for anyone who was contemplating doing business in Russia. Of course, it didn't stop Rex Tillerson. He screwed it up later. But um, I, I think the, the, the next, and I am getting to the end of this, I promise, but the, the, the next important stage, of course, was the ICIJ and other revelations of offshore accounts around in, in, in uh, the Mossack Fonseca and, and the, other, the other data dumps, which showed the massive use of these havens, not only by rich Russian businessmen, which most people suspected, but by people like Rudol Dulgin, uh, Putin's cellist, who had no business having an offshore tax haven, as far as anyone could figure out. Um, and of course, many 
U.S. and British business people, including Mr. Bill Browder. Uh, but you know, it, it, it just it underlined the, the degree of what I guess you would call um, uh, uh, it underlined the kleptocracy narrative, which had had a very much uh, sort of anchored itself at that point. So that brings us to the events of 2014, which I will not bore you with because I think we're all familiar with 2014, which is the revolution in Ukraine, the Russian reaction to that, the, um, the takeover of Crimea, and the insurgency and takeover of two regions in southeastern Ukraine. Um, so we are today in a situation of what I think David had posed as, as demonization, which I think is correct because we are in a, in a, in a open-ended economic and military, potentially military confrontation. Um, there are no trade, I mean, the, the, what, what's remarkable is that trade is almost, has, has collapsed to a great degree between the EU and Russia, EU being one of the, Russia's largest trading partners. It declined by 44% between 2012 and 2016, which I think is extraordinary. Total U.S. trade with Russia, if the figure is, if I understood the website correctly, is 27 billion, I think, in 2018, which is, which is a third of the of Jeff Bezos's personal fortune. It's nothing for for two of the largest countries on earth. There's there's essentially there's no trade going on, uh, which means no relationship. Um, and then we have the situation, of course, is that as the result of the 2014 events. Uh, and then the Skripal events, which are discrete, you have senior political and business leaders sanctioned uh, in Russia. Uh, and they're sanctioned in such a, they're sanctioned by the US, they're sanctioned by Ukraine, they're sanctioned by the EU, the Russians sanction us, we sanction, everyone sanctions each other. Um, and some people are sanctioned simply because they're friends with Putin, some people are sanctioned because they use WMD on, on one of our countries. Um, so it's, it's, it's all a bit of a mess. So um, I think we all see this in the media today. I, I won't name names here because it's, it's sort of petty and it's my own opinion. But we can see that some of the people on Twitter who, who accuse everyone left and right of being a traitor. The New York Post themselves called me Putin's pawn, um, which I'm insulted by. I'd like to at least be his rook. Um, uh, my, my, some of my good friends who have worked on Russiagate have been accused by both sides of being everything from Russian spies to being, I don't know what they're even being accused of on the other side, I can't keep track. Um, but it, it just, yes, thank you. Um, but it, it just outlines the, the absolutely toxic and poisonous uh, environment that, that we're in. So uh, I'm gonna move into my, and I promise this is very brief, my view of why this is unproductive, then I will go to Topher, and then we will open up the rest of the session for discussion, questions, whatever, if you'd like to call us names, whatever you'd like to do. So uh, when I, my, my view is, from my experience in my career, is that the demonization is unproductive. I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's sort of made of whole cloth or that it doesn't, I think it's very obvious that this, this demonization is the product of very real but very complex geo, geopolitical events in which some Russia has only itself to blame and some of which we have ourselves to blame. So I'd like to quote Mark Galliotti, somebody who's known to many of you here, but I think is one of the few truly sober level heads in this whole public debate, at least in English. And, and he said this, he tweeted this last week, and, and I'm just gonna quote this tweet because I, I do think this really summed it up for me. Depressing that this point needs to be made, but it does. Just as there are voices in the West too eager to excuse everything Putin does, there are even more who regard Russia as irredeemably rotten and all Russians with it, which is dangerous and dumb. He's right. I mean, unfortunately, the Russians don't help themselves because they, you know, they, they, the way they make their case is it, it culturally is often very inappropriate here. I had a, a Russian client who's become very famous and I adored her, but her, I always found that her misunderstand, her basic misunderstanding of how American politics and just society worked caused her to, to say and do very stupid things which could be inadvertently offensive. I think if you watch RT or even some of the weirder outlets that Russia sponsors like the, anti, the overtly anti-Semitic Russian insider, you see that, uh, you know, that, 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 that it's very one note and that they, they do not necessarily understand the roots of why we see them as we do, just as we fail to see them 
see, to see why they perceive us in certain ways, which is another conference panel. Um, so my agenda is not to worry, I, I'm not worried about the image of the Russian regime per se, I'm worried about the image of, of Russia and how we deal with it. Um, and I think if we fail to see Russia as a more or less, in, in quotes, normal country, which is a, a country where we have different interest groups, not all democratic, in fact, many of them not democratic, uh, but, but it's not just, a, you know, there are many interest groups, there, there's business, there's an economy, there are, there are civilians, there are people who just want to go to work. All this, they're really basic things that, that I think as Westerners, especially as Americans of a certain age, have forgotten because we've spent almost our entire lifetimes going back to the Cold War, planning to obliterate them. So, um, and we tend, and now we have this, this habit of blaming them for our broken democracy. Um, and we blame, we, blame, I, we blame them for Trump. You know, if we don't like Trump, we blame the Russians for him. Uh, if you don't like Brexit, you blame Russia for it. Uh, and that doesn't mean, or if you don't like the European far right, you don't like Salvini in Italy, you blame Russia for it. It doesn't mean that Russia's not involved. It doesn't mean that Russia hasn't given money to the far right European groups, but what it means is they didn't invent any of this. We just found it convenient to, to put it all on their heads. Um, so I think you know, the, the current sanctions regime is something that absolutely needs to be addressed because it does, as I mentioned before, it treats some of the worst atrocities seen in the modern era, which again, people may disagree with me here, but the use of WMD on, on, on British soil twice, I think is, is an unforgivable crime. And those, and, and, but there's a mechanism for sanctioning those people and we are, Britain and the US are using those mechanisms and leave those, leave those be. But when it comes to Crimea, I mean, I don't think anyone in this room foresees any outcome for Crimea but for it staying part of Russia. And I, there would probably, if there were a free and fair election in Crimea, that would be the outcome as well. So we need to negotiate a smart outcome which ensures that minority rights are observed and that, this, that we are not sanctioning people for something that we know will never change. Because we did this in Iran, we did this in Iraq, you have open-ended sanctions which will never go away unless the other side completely capitulates and nobody ever completely capitulates until they're destroyed. Um, so, you know, and I, 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 we would treat the south, you know, southeastern Ukraine as, as, a, as a different problem, go after the people who are actually there and, and doing those things, probably bring some of them to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, um, which would be easier if we were part of the International Criminal Court of The Hague. Um, and you know, you know, if if the sanctions list could be massively pared down, many of my former clients are actually on this list, and and I can promise you, I mean, on one, in one case, the guy's a moron. Like the guy's harmless. He just signed something in the Russian Senate, which was involved in the Crimea thing. He he has lots of business assets. He's harmless. Like why we are doing this? Why we are are deliberately handcuffing ourselves by sanctioning people who have no. Does anyone think that he has the power to, to change the situation? So I, I think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of taking people off sanctions lists, making it clear to Russia that there is a way out that doesn't involve total surrender, that we are willing to come to the negotiation table, but certain people who did certain things that are so beyond the pale of international norms have to be punished. And that is how we, we can treat each other as adults. Um, uh, finally, I would just, you know, I would say the bottom line is, you know, our our obligation as Amer you know, and I'm saying most of the people in this room are American or British, I assume. Our obligations as Americans or Brits are, 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 are simply to uphold the norms of the treaties that our countries are a party to. We're not here to enforce morality on Russia. It will never work. You, you know, the, morality has no place in international law. It's not what international law is generally about. It is, first and foremost, it is about agreements that countries take on, and we need to enforce those. And if we can do that in a selective way without collective punishment of Russian citizens or the country, then I think we, 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 we have a, a way forward. And finally, I would just say that there is this tendency, and I see this more in the British media than the American media, of portraying Russians as nouveau riche mobsters who just go around like, you know, swanning about Mayfair, and, you know, as, as if they just dropped from space. But come on, they, all, all, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't they wouldn't have that house in Mayfair. They wouldn't be able to go to those restaurants, do any of those things if they didn't have access to Western markets, Western money managers, what, you know, and, and all the structures that we have created for our own billionaires who all similarly like to flout laws and taxes. So to, so to, to, to maybe address this view of, of Russians as sort of you know, naive, rich thugs would, would also probably be helpful. So 
with that rant, I will uh, turn it over to my friend Topher. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry that went on so long. All right, first a little bit about me. I, so I was in, in grad school. I was probably one of a hand, just a handful of Americans who could identify the various countries in Central Asia on a map in 2001. So I got sucked into the Afghanistan war and worked for Rumsfeld for five, five, five years or so. And then I moved over, I got traded like a baseball player and worked for Condi for several years. And during that entire time, I could not escape Russia. And my viewpoint coming out of grad school had been very sympathetic to Russia, but after my time dealing with Russia, it changed a lot. Um, so n not that I, not that I, Ed and I necessarily disagree with things. I, I, for example, don't think the sanctions are working, but I lean towards we should be tougher on things than get rid of them. Although I do think we should get rid of them. We should just replace them with something meaner. But, um, <laughs> but that being said, so a, a cheap ret rhetorical trick is to beg the, the premise of a question, so here goes. Uh, I think instead of asking whether Russia should be demonized, we should be asking what does corruption mean to Putin? And I've broken that up into two parts because it's, it's a very important tool for him. Um, domestically, he doesn't see corruption as a challenge. Rather, it's the glue that's holding his regime together. Uh, and I, I'd go so far as to say it's vital for his survival. Ed mentioned Yukos, and that's a perfect example of what I was talking about. Uh, on paper, Putin went after Kordakovsky because he was corrupt, but he really went after Kordakovsky because Kordakovsky was not standing behind Putin. It, that, that's, the, that's the stick part of, of corruption, but on the carrot side of corruption, Putin's promise basically is to let the oligarchs, if they support him, do whatever they do, steal whatever they steal, the state will more or less back them up, provided at the end of the day they stand behind him. And a, a good example of that were, were the Olympics in Sochi. That, that was just a festival of, th of thievery. And for the most part, Putin stood behind these guys, even though they turned out a pretty mediocre product. There were a lot of build, building mistakes and you know, $60 billion for sidewalks and all kinds of nutty nonsense. But for the most part, he let the government pay the bills because at the end of the day, they made Putin look good. And that, that's really what matters. And so, Corruption is this two-sided coin that he uses um, to remain powerful, you know, relative to Russia, of course. And he, it's what he uses to keep his band of stabby oligarchs in line and stabbing outside the tent rather than inside the tent. Uh, it's, so that domestically, it, 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 he has no incentive to go after corruption. So if we go to him and argue that he should do something about corruption, he's not going to do anything, or he's just going to lie to us. So we shouldn't bother with that, that argument with him. Overseas, corruption plays also a supporting role, but it's somewhat different. Um, it, it, again, it's an incentive for punishment and, and supporting him overseas for oligarchs. But as Ed explained, not, not, you know, notwithstanding the constant hand wringing about Russia, Corruption helps him mask the fact that Russia is really, really weak. I, I've called it a third world dump before and got um, pilloried by, by Russian trolls. I kind of get sick pleasure in inviting their, their, their hatred of me. It, it's kind of like Nigeria with nukes, and I'm sure I'll, you know, no, no offense to Nigeria here. Um, that was Upper Volta. Or, <laughs> upper Volta with nukes. Yeah. <laughs> we updated that phrase for the time. Uh, but. So I think it's important to go through a little bit of what the reality on the ground is in, in Russia. Despite the fact that they have twice as many people as in Spain, and despite the fact that Russia is one of the richest countries on earth in terms of mineral wealth, its GDP is virtually identical to Spain's. In fact, I think Spain's might be a little higher. I haven't looked in a while. And the reason why is corruption. And on, on paper, Russia is a middle-income country, but you strip away the natural resources the benefit of which the Russian people don't see anyway, and it's the same as most African nations. In fact, a lot of African nations and Latin American nations have a higher income than Russia once you strip away these natural resources. And Thomas Piketty published a paper with the World Bank a couple of years ago where he made the point that 
The Russians have more money stashed over overseas than the, and this is the money they, they know of, more money stashed overseas than the entire GDP of Russia. I mean, that is incredible. But, and that's just the money they know of. That's not including, say, the 80 or so billion dollars that Putin himself has stashed away somewhere. Can I just thank you for citing Thomas Piketty? Yeah. <laughs> It, 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 you know, much of that money be belongs to the, the oligarchs that we talked about on the domestic front, but its role overseas is, it, it creates a lingua franca in a, in a sense. Um, you know, I, I've been watching Putin at a granular, Ed might, Ed might say, obsessive level since the 90s, and I'm totally convinced the guy doesn't plan. Um, he, he constantly maneuvers to create space, and he plans ways to to create freedom of movement, but another way of saying the way Putin does things, he just does what he can get away with. And to the extent he plans stuff, he just tries to get away with more. And that's where corruption comes in because it, it, it's a universal language. Corruption is a self-selecting mechanism. It, people that get involved in corruption, they, they're pliable, of course, but they also don't come with all this messy baggage about uh, you know, respect for the Constitution or, you know, patriotism or all that type of stuff. He can deal with everyone. Not, not that he is trying to strip all that away, but he's, but the KGB learned long ago that this was a very uh, easy way to strip away all the problems rather than fighting patriotism, just ignore it. And that's what the KGB did. And uh, it, it creates a common tongue among people that they can deal with. And of course, that's on top of the simple and obvious fact about Russian corruption is it, it creates a whole bunch of people that you can bribe. But I, I, that I don't think is as important as just the, the idea that corruption is this loose cannon rolling around the decks of the, the world economy. And, and that in itself serves its purpose. Of course, this loose cannon, is, loose cannon is owned by the oligarchs, so going after them serves its purpose. But so if, if you force Putin to go after his domestic corruption, it would also defang a, a huge disproportionate part of their foreign policy, so he's just not going to do it. And, you know, the, the interesting thing here is, is the minute the Russian people see that the rest of the world believes Russia to be a 13 time zone wide uh, Superfund site, which it is, is the minute they are going to stop trusting Putin. The Russian people aren't dumb. They, they know what's going on, they know about the corruption, but they, they choose to deal with it, one, because not dealing with it gets you, could get you in big trouble, but two, there's a fantasy that I think is pretty wild, widespread in Russia that Putin has made Russia powerful again. It's not. I mean, Putin, it, it's objectively not the case that Russia is not a powerful country. And, but the minute the Russian people realize they've been dealing with all this garbage from Putin is the minute they stop dealing with the garbage from Putin. And that's very, very dangerous for him. Um, but Putin uses corruption to mask over reality. So in the US, in particular, but in the West in general, we, we have this insane problem of talking about Russia all the time. And, oh, sorry, I lost my place. It, you know, instead of building aircraft carriers and whatnot, we should be funding NGOs and funding people that know how to use anti-corruption tools. That would drive Putin bananas. But by, by oddly enough, by building aircraft carriers and talking about Russia is this you know, counterweight to US power, or Western power, or whatever, we're actually helping make Putin's case that Russia is important. If we just swatted him away and say, you know what, you clown, go clean up your shop, the Russians would throw him out of power in a second. Um, and it, if we started going, going after his corrupt enablers, it would force Putin to f spend a whole lot of time on, on on defending corruption and, and, and basically cleaning up his own house, and he would have less time to, get, to build this narrative that Russia is a superpower. I just wanted to tick through just a couple examples of what I'm talking about. So several years ago, two years ago, I think, the US reestablished the Second Fleet, and the Second Fleet's job, and during the Cold War, its only job, was to patrol the North Atlantic against Russian, the Russian Navy. Now, what you never hear is the Russian flagship um, the Admiral Kuznetsov, you hear about this all the time, but this thing smokes like it's on fire. The U.S. spends billions and billions of dollars to figure out how to find ships on the high seas. It's very, very hard. You can't use radar because the Earth is curved. 
Well, the Kuznetsov smokes so much, you can see it with the naked eye for 200 miles. That, that is not the stuff of a superpower. They, their, their fifth generation fighter, they co-developed it, kind of like how we did the Joint Strike Fighter, we developed it with a whole bunch of nations. They did theirs with India. The final result was such garbage, the Indians refused not to buy any, and it was so expensive, the Russians could only afford 11. It, it's, it's not stretching the truth to say that Putin deployed almost his entire fleet of fifth generation fighters to Syria to go bomb children. I mean, it's, that's literally what happened. And, and again, it takes an amazing amount of PR effort and subterfuge to make the world believe that that stuff is the stuff of a superpower. So take away his free time to spin this yarn that he does and force him to you know, take away corruption, which allows him to keep his house in order. And this narrative is going to start falling apart, and pretty soon Putin's uh, world will fall apart. It, it, his, he knows his case for being back, for Russia being back, is very weak, and it can't survive scrutiny. So he needs, he needs to be able to spin this yarn so till, till we stay away from this scrutiny. You know, but, to pause a second, I don't think Putin's an idiot. I don't, I don't think he's a master genius, which is what he wants the world to believe that he's like some second coming of Dr. Evil. He, he was a middling, but competent KGB officer. Now, I, as I mentioned, the KGB, is one of the most important tools was corruption, which is why he leans on it so much. He knows it works, and he knows it's effective. And if you look at how Putin has built his diplomatic toolkit, he relies disproportionately on those KGB tools because those are the ones he knows how to use. And he knows how to use the ones that actually worked because he deployed them when he was in, the, uh, when he was in East Germany. And his skill set was not being some undercover secret agent, although he may have been undercover, I don't know. His, his, main, his skill was on information warfare, which is why you see so much of it right now. And a huge part of information warfare, political warfare, is corruption, which is why you see a lot of it right now. I, I keep trying to call it strategic corruption, and it's just not catching on. Um, in, as, as I mentioned, if we went after corruption it was, as a conservative, it would also have this ancil, ancil, ancillary benefit that we wouldn't be wasting so much money on building aircraft carriers. The, a, a lot of my you know, fellow conservatives want to build 19 aircraft carriers. Trump requested $33 billion in his budget request so that Primarily, they can repel the you know the Russian threat. There's no Russian threat. I mean, they've they have spent the better part of what four years now trying to take over two percent of Ukraine, and they have not managed to do it yet. Or I should say, pacify, because they have effectively taken it over. The Ukrainian army, which is a basket case, many many multiplied players worse off than the Russian, held them back, and that is not the stuff of a super. The the Tip, the pointy tip of the Russian spear was is this company Wagner, which is this weird paranoid manifestation of how the Russians see Blackwater to have been. And they, they tried attacking not just, not a special forces, forces unit, but a normal unit of US, I think it was Marines. And the US, this is very, very uncommon in warfare. They killed all of them. They, they didn't repel them, they eliminated them. And you just don't ever hear that, that 400, of the most highly trained GRU agents on Russian soil, and they just don't exist anymore. That is, that's incredible. And it only took 45 minutes, which is just, that's storybook stuff. And, but what that is not is power of superpower. And that's, Putin's goal is to spin that yarn. And the only reason why he has the luxury to spin that yarn is we not focus on his corruption. And Putin knows that. And he knows that if we really went after Ru Corruption, it would, be, it would be like going after his kryptonite. You would hear him squeal in eight seconds flat. So the question with Russia isn't, are they demonized? It's, do we see corruption the way Putin does? And the answer is no, but the fact that we're having this discussion at this conference means that it's changing. I spent a lot of years in government trying to explain to people that just because the Kremlin changed its flag in 1991 doesn't mean they threw away the toolbox. And I, you know, for many, many years, I got called the knuckle-dragging troglodyte, which Probably was fair, but I ain't called that less now. And so, although the world's not turn, turning on a dime, the world is turning, and eventually, inevitably, policymakers will figure this out. And, you know, you had Bush rightfully called a fool for looking into Putin's soul, but we don't talk about that because Obama had a bigger foolish mistake with his whole dumb reset policy. But we don't talk about that because Trump and his whole naivety goofiness with Russia and 
not even talking about the collusion stuff, but his backing of Russia and believing that there's some power. Not whitewash this, but it sucks all the oxygen out of the room of the past, uh, past presidents. But the issue with Trump and Russia has been so big that I'm betting the next president is not going to make that, mis that same mistake again. So I, I think the trend where you have presidents come in and think they can quote unquote deal with Putin is, I think that's done. The, the, the presidents get religion. It took seven years for Bush. It took about five for Obama. I think Trump has gotten his religion about two and a half. And the next one will come into office if it's a Democrat on day one wanting to do something about Russia. And if it's a Republican, that president will just want to stay away from Russia as much as humanly possible. So, so I, I think Russia has really shot itself into a foot on this. The other point I make too is, I, I have almost like I have almost a Tourette's-like reaction when I hear people say that Putin's played his a weak hand wisely. I don't argue with the fact that he has a weak hand, but I don't think it's wise what he's done because what he's done is he's painted painted himself into a corner from which he's going to have an awful tough time extracting himself. But there is one exception to the, to my. Tourette's reaction, and that's the, the my, my sorry, my Tourette's reaction to people saying that we're in a Cold War framework. There's one exception to that, and that's that by using corruption as Putin does, he is very difficult, and this is really tough to do. He's aligned the interests of the Russian people with pretty much everybody in the West, which is to say, aligned their interests against Putin. Ask Gorbachev how that worked out. Not, not that, not that. We're in some Cold War thing. We're going to go undermine, you know, this evil empire. I, I think probably what ways can work is people are just going to start to stop dealing with the Russians, and Putin will collapse under his own weight. However, Putin is going to have an awfully tough time. He's going to have to reverse his sell job to us before this changes, and it's going to be pretty darn tough to do because a lot of the propaganda that went out, especially after the shoot down of the of the Malaysian Airlines with all the Dutch on it, they blasted the Dutch with information warfare, all this nonsense about how uh, Ukrainian fighters shot it down, all this crazy stuff. They spent so much capital on that kind of stuff. For them to turn tail, they are going to have to uh, ad basically admit the wrong and, and, and capitulate, which, as Ed correctly pointed out, they're not going to do. So I, I, I don't see this ending well for Putin either way. But if the U.S. wanted to, or the West, wanted to expedite things along, they would focus on this corruption piece because it, it is this critical tool for Putin. Um, and, and they would start seeing corruption not as this bad thing we need to stamp out, but as this critical foundational enabling block for, for Putin himself. And the minute that happened, if that happened at the same time the Russian people get pushed to that tipping point, no one really knows what that is. The Russians are more patient than anyone I've ever um, had issues with to that tipping point where they say, all right, we're not going to deal with your garbage anymore, Putin. This is not worth it, your corruption, whatnot. If, if those two things happen even remotely at the same time, Putin could be gone in a flash before anyone in the West suspects it. And that's why I think Putin's really does himself a very dangerous hand here. Because, I mean, it could happen tomorrow. I, I don't think it will, but it could. And it, it's not going to be, even like how the Cold War was, yes, the CIA missed the end of the Cold War, but it happened pretty darn quickly. And not that this is anything like the end of the Cold War, but like that, I don't think people are going to see it coming because I think it's probably going to be the Russian people that decide to throw, throw him out. Now it would be, they'll be enabled by us basically forcing Putin to sit on his hands, but when we go to corruption, but I, the West is slowly beginning to figure this out. And when, when it does, it's going to be a, a, a big problem for Putin. But you know, key is that key is that uh, terminology that corruption's not it's not good or bad. It is bad, but it's not seen as this thing that if we could just get rid of it, Russia would be a normal country. If we got rid of it in the context of Russia, Russia would not be the way it is right now. It, it's foundational to the to the regime Putin has built, and I, I agree with Ed that there's a pretty bright dividing line between the very, very small clique of people who control the Kremlin and most of the Russian people. But I also think that most of the Russian people more or less agree with me, and that should be pretty darn scary if you're in charge of this people. But with that, I'll open it up to questions. I'm going to ask the first question. Um, just actually two things which are related. One, when, when you talk about 
Um, well, I just find it very interesting. When, 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 when I talk about Russia, I never actually deliberately never mention Putin. Uh, and you almost never mention Russia uh, and mention Putin. So two things. One, uh, as we both had our heads beaten in in Russian studies, like the, and, you know, when you have regime change, it's usually disastrous. So we, we and um, Americans have this bad habit of talking about, you know, eliminating leaders, removing them. Or what, what would be this possible scenario that he could go that wouldn't lead, lead us into a much worse situation? And I forgot the second one, so that's fine. I, I'm not sure there is one. I mean, in the short run. The, in, the, in the long run, of course, you could end up with what we have right now. But I, it depends on how you look at it. If you look at it as just for the interests of the Russian people, or are you looking for the interests of all the people that Russia is annoying, which is pretty much everybody? And so if you're the U.S. or the West or Norway or Finland or whomever, your week is going to get much, much better the day Putin's gone. The Russian people, not so much. But the, and it, and it could arguably be worse than what we had after the end of the Cold War because even though they, were, they tended, up not, tended not to work very well, the West had a whole infrastructure ready to go to help Russia and the former Soviet Union change. Now there's nothing because the West has been living under this fantasy that if we just bring Russia into our institutions, they're going to start playing by our rules. And so I, up to this point, we've been approaching this problem completely unprepared. I mean, I was, I was in Iraq a long time, and I think it's, it would actually be worse than Iraq. Maybe without the guns, but it would be worse than Iraq. <laughs> With that cheerful thought, uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, do you have yeah. yeah, I have it. Uh, Lucy Commissar, I'm a journalist. Now, as a journalist, I like to stick to the facts and not the broad generalizations, which usually cover up the fact that the person doesn't have a lot of facts. So let me throw out a couple of facts. One, a scripple. Uh, the New York Times ran an article a couple of weeks ago about the CIA director, Gina Haspel, and uh, one of the stories they told was that she told Trump about Scripple that uh, as a result of the, you called it WMD, I think that's a bit of a hype, but uh, because the, the city is still there, uh, but that there were a lot of dead ducks and that children had been taken to hospital with, with symptoms that looked like they came from whatever that substance was. Well, The Guardian, which is hardly uh, a pro-Russian newspaper, actually did some investigation and talked to people in, the, in that town and found out there were no dead ducks and there were no children brought to the hospital with such symptoms. It was a total lie. She told it to Trump. As a result, he decided to uh, add sanctions, to throw some people out of the country. It was all fake. About Khodorkovsky, and we're talking about corruption, uh, Khodorkovsky, and I know because I investigated that particularly, he was using transfer pricing in the Isle of Man to cheat the minority shareholders of Yugos and the tax authorities by selling the oil to a, a fake company in the Isle of Man at a low price and selling it out on a market price. He was a cheat. The FT actually wrote an article about some of the... Um, the operations that were going on in London as part of that, and I got, a, I got the documents, so... Lisa, I'll, I'll cut you off on that one, because I agree with you on the Hodokovsky. What I said was that it appeared at the time to be that. What I learned later changed yeah. my mind, because I worked... I don't want to go into the details, but I worked with, the, with a U.S. law firm that was representing the Russian government in their arbitration with Yuko. So I've seen, I've seen what Yuko's got up to, and I, and I saw what they got up to in the Zato, uh, low tax regions of Russia and stuff like this. I, 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 could, I could make a worse case no, than you than okay, about Hodorkovsky, so I'm not disagreeing with you. Okay, but what I'm saying is an awful lot of what uh, your, your colleague said was pretty much evidence-free. For example, where do you, what is your evidence that Putin has stashed away $80 billion? How do you get the number, and where is the money? What is your evidence? The, the, 80, the 80 number, I'm just extrapolating from the fact that the $40 billion number was published about 10 years ago. Uh, so in, in theory, he could have lost it all. Yeah, 
Yeah, but what's the evidence for it? So is your, your supposition that Putin doesn't have any money? No, I'm order? saying that you make it up. Look, Browder goes around saying it all the time. You know how Browder makes up the money? Maybe that's where the, the figure comes from. Browder said okay. that he, he actually at one point said, well, I, 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 I imagine, imagine this, that at a certain point he said, Putin brought in all the oligarchs and said, if you want to keep operating, you have to give me 10%. Uh, Browder is imagining this. He actually said that. And then he, Browder added up all the numbers and he came up with the figure of how much Putin will well, have. Is that one, what you're talking about? No, he said 100 billion. Okay, 100 billion. But the so whole thing one, is one, crazy and no, it's fact free. One, one place where it's published is the book that I mentioned, Karen DeWisha's <laughs> Kleptocracy. That book had What's so much. Kle Karen DeWisha. Karen DeWisha, she just passed away about a year ago. Uh, uh, Kleptocracy. That book had so many facts in it, bad for Putin that the Oxford University Press almost would not publish it because they were afraid Putin would kill them. Now, I mean, you can deny the facts all you want, but I mean, there's, there's 300 pages of it that outline what the KGB did, what Putin did, how much money they stole, and how they use it. I mean, I, the first half of what I talked about was basically her book. I would want to see the documentation. I haven't read the book. Okay. It's like $17. Yeah, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah I... Rick Cadenas, I'm from IRS Chief Counsel International. I have a question. Because, you know, Russia comes to the table at OECD, right? And they have apparently normal relations, treaty relations with the world and Europe on information exchange and whatever else. Uh, do you feel that they're, some of their, like let's say their tax authority uh, is in any way compromised? You know, like let's say in most countries, the tax authority is separate from the political. I'll say that. In, in Russia, like I say, they come to the OECD and you know, they have normal white shoe type relationships with all the European countries, they have information exchange, they sit on panels and so on. I'd just like to know your views of whether you think like, you know, I know domestically they've done some, some things that well, seem improper in terms of Have you ever seen authority. a picture of the Russian tax police? They, uh, what I'm trying to say, the question is whether you, your views on whether they are controlled by oh, yeah. a political function, or are they, you know, that they come forward as being independent and just collecting taxes and so on, and, and like... The, uh, I, you know, I, I can't speak for the, the bureaucracy that, uh, that is responsible for tabulating all the taxes, but the point of spear of the tax police, they, they dress in black, they wear masks, they go knock on the doors, and well, knock down doors, people, and like Kordakovsky, for example, the tax police showed up at his front door, oddly enough, right after he said he was going to run for president. I mean, they're, what Putin has done, which is something that a lot of authoritarian regimes have done, is they weaponize the tax police. And the, pretty much, if you're a billionaire in Russia, there's a pretty darn good chance that you're just not a good person. But if you're Putin, you selectively choose when to prosecute that person for being bad. Like Kordakovsky, no question, bad guy. But that only, that all that does is create a tool by which Putin can go after them whenever he feels like he wants to. I, but I would, I would say to that is I've had some dealings with the, the, the called the Federal Tax Service, the FNS. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a micro level, they're fine. I mean, it's, yes, on, on, if you're dealing with sort of big cases and things like that, it, it could be ugly. But, uh, you know, they, they provide generally reliable data. If you're just talking about a, a, an average individual, if you're talking about their their aggregate data statistics and their general enforcement, uh, I would say that they're, you know, they're, I, I mean, I wouldn't compare it to, you know, say our, our, our own, you know, uh, IRS here or something like that, but, the, you know, the, they're, they're highly competent. Hi, I have a question for both of you. Um, many of us refer to the status today as competition short of conflict. Um, what are your views on is do you believe the conflict in Ukraine is um, to test the NATO capabilities, or is it just kind of to distract and f um, Russia focus more on their investment in Africa, relations with African nations, as well as South America? I'd like to hear your view on all of those, because as you know, there are some relations happening in Africa, such as with Sudan and of course Venezuela. So what, what are your views from both your sides? I'll answer from my side, which is the Ukrainian side, 
and then maybe his side, more the, the, the U.S. sort of political diplomatic side, uh, uh, because I've worked a lot in, in eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk, before, before the, the, the conflict. It, it, it's, an, it's an interesting situation because, to a certain extent, the, the, there's sort of two competing narratives. One is the sort of frozen conflict narrative, i.e. that Russia maintains in, you know, in Moldova, in Georgia, these, these regions which are only recognized by it and a few other countries, which are sort of generally slightly basket cases. But, but um, the other is that it's just simply a bargaining chip because they, so if right now they control some very valuable, say, coal mines and, and one large steel mill. But if they just moved over to Mariupol, they could take out two of the largest steel mills in Ukraine uh, and is one, one of its top three ports and you know, wiped, I don't know, 10 to 15% off GDP overnight. And they don't do that. Um, and so I think that's telling that to me it's, it's more indicative that it's, it's some sort of bargaining chip. The problem is, is I, I don't know how Donetsk would ever be a normal Ukrainian city after that, which is why the Russians have pushed for this, the, the, you know, this, what they call sort of this federalization program whereby Ukraine would adopt a federal makeup where it could, it could tolerate auto, semi-autonomous units within it, which the current constitutional makeup of Ukraine doesn't do, but Russia does. So, and then I take it to you. As you might expect, I take a more cynical view of it. I, I, I think a lot of it is Putin getting away with what he can. I, I was actually in Tbilisi when, when Russia invaded Georgia. And one of the, I actually ran the program that was training the Georgia military, and it was not to train, you know, killer snipers or any of that kind of nonsense. The main focus of the problem, actually, program actually was to, uh, w was to, was focused on Shevardnadze because he kept stealing everything and we wanted to give in him incentive to start institutionalizing some of the parts of the government and this was the military. The actual training we gave them was about the level of what Boy Scouts get at Boy Scout camp here in the U.S. But with that level of training, they actually stopped Russia where they stopped, but there's no question Russia was going to try and come to Tbilisi. They just couldn't. And so I, I, I take the view that he wasn't trying to evade Georgia to create a bargaining chip. He was trying to evade Georgia because he could until he couldn't. And, and I think Ukraine was uh, um, kind of the same way. I mean, one of the big complaints coming from Russia when this Crimea happened and the invasion of the Donbass happened was right when Ukraine started trying to make, they, they, I forget what the treaty was, it was a treaty with the, it was some kind of friendship treaty with the EU. And there's one way to interrupt that discussion and that's to invade Ukraine. And there's no question, especially in the north of Ukraine, that they tried to do more, they just got repelled by this bizarre mix of private armies and said, hey, it was a chaotic mess. But the point is, he wasn't trying to carve off the Donbass so he had you know, a future stake in negotiations. He, he was trying to just take as much Ukraine as he can get. And he was trying to change, change the narrative of the discussion, which he did, by the way. <coughs> it, but, you know, Ed, Ed said many years ago that Ru Russian foreign policy can be described as he's the guy that comes and burns down your house and then arrives first on the scene to demand an investigation. There is that part of, part of things. That's why Russia is demanding to be part of the negotiations about <coughs> Ukraine, which they are invading. So if you think about that, it's kind of nutty. But the Russians have long learned that this is a way to stay relevant. I mean, if you really wanted to drive the Russians crazy, start a serious effort to kick them off the UN Security Council, they will go bananas. Now, I don't think that will ever happen, but on a much more scaled on version, in their own neighborhood, they know they can get beat up on the Ukrainians. Anybody can beat up on the Ukrainians. They know they can beat up on the Georgians. Oh, <laughs> the Georgians beat up on the Georgians. But it's noteworthy that it's not Estonia, whom they arguably hate more than the Ukrainians. But the, Putin's not dumb. He's not going to go invade Estonia, who could probably invade and occupy Moscow at this point. But the, it, it, again, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's Putin being strategic. I don't think he is strategic at all. I, I think he's just doing what the moment presents, presents him. And at the moment, Ukraine was a crazy basket case. So when, when Georgia, when the invasion in Georgia happened, the country was completely turned upside down. Now, it was improving. It was on a much better track than it had been on under Shevardnadze. But at that moment in time, it was a totally basket case of a country. 
Yeah, I would just conclude and just, and just say that I, I knew some of the people who had been in Donetsk when the actual sort of things went down, and, and it was very much, it, you know, these were not, these were not Russian troops. These, these, were, these, were, these were people who had sort of been pressed in by existing FSB networks to, to sort of bring about an uprising. Some people who just genuinely, there was a lot of unrest amongst the, the workers who were very unhappy with the, how, the, how things were being run. Of course, this is Yanukovych's home territory, so, you know, it wasn't the fault of, uh, of you know, of ordinary Ukrainians that it was that way, but it was, uh, you know, it, it, was a spon it was a fairly quickly done, so I would agree with him that, yeah, it was, it was done very spontaneously, but now the purpose of it is they have it, use it to negotiate with, and I think that's, that's actually, that's, you know, if I were in this situation, that's what I would do, so. Um, sorry. Uh I think we need to take a, be cautious and have a balanced approach in how we view Russia from this perspective. So I agree that we can't feed into the narrative when they try to overproject their influence or strength. But on the flip side, uh, to, to view them as emaciated is dangerous as well. So uh, look at DPRK. Just because they uh, have to use uh, wood burning or coal burning vehicles doesn't mean they're not a threat. Yeah. They're still very much a viable threat. So. Um, the other issue of corruption, we're, there's no eliminating corruption at any level, right? At the lowest levels, yes. Um, but I agree that we need to take an approach that uh, targets the fringes of what we can more readily influence in terms of that network of corruption. So we're not going to get at the core. That's going to take time. But going along to the areas that we may have better influence, I think that's where we need to focus, and I agree with that. Um, on the issue of sanctions, so the reason individuals get sanctioned or, sanctioned or entities get sanctioned is because they were in violation, or uh, since it's a bunch of lawyers, I'll say allegedly found in violation of something, right? So I, again, I'm not a lawyer, but having the stance or defense be, I'm a moron, I don't know how well that would hold up. So there's a level of wittingness in everything. So over time, if an individual's behavior is sustained, unchanging, there's a point where you can inject the, the concept of willful ignorance is, 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 is associated with the behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think, and I agree with you, that sanctions sometimes are not as effective, directly don't have the effect that we're looking for, but they can be used as a strategic messaging tool. And we're trying to degrade or deter behavior, so having that uh, in, in the open source and mass media is, is necessary to a certain point. But sometimes, yeah, I, I, I do agree that sometimes it needs to be a little heavier handed. Um, but to say that we need to relook at the sanctions list and take a bunch of people off, I, I think we need to be cautious of that because there was a reason why we went down that road. Because honestly, there's a lot of information that uh, governments right off of that doesn't make it into the open source. So you're not going to be aware of, hey, this guy doesn't seem that bad. Why, why is this individual mm -hmm. being sanctioned? Um, so there's a level of that that goes on as well. I, co I completely agree with the second part, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you, you know, refer to the first part. I, I completely agree, sir, on that. I, I would just say what I sort of meant by that, and I think I didn't probably present it very properly, was just that there, there, there needs to be a sense of quid pro quo that if steps are taken by both sides, that the sanctions don't have to be all removed at once because that's sort of what the Russian demand has been, but it's simply that there's a way of stepping, de-escalating some of the sanctions by removing certain people. If, say, there's a Crimea settlement, obviously that would obviate the need for sanctions that were directly linked to, to, to Crimea, whereas there are some sanctions which, which are linked, I mean, there are sanctions, Russian sanctions which are linked to DPRK. I don't think we should touch that. There are sanctions that are linked to uh, to, to the DNR and LNR, the, 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 to southeastern Ukraine, uh, there are sanctions then, then linked to the, to, to the Chemical and Biological Weapons Convention. So I, I think if, if we could show that these are not, that the sanctions could be removed in part for, in return for something, not absolute capitulation, but some mediated agreement on one issue, remove some sanctions, I think that would just show everyone that, that there's, there's a path forward. But I, I completely agree with what you're, what you're saying. The mic keeps cutting off. I, I, I mostly agree, too. I, I, I had a professor in grad school, his name is Andre Schleifer, and the way he, his big thing, well, he had two reasons why he came to the fame. First one was, he postulated that, that uh, corruption will eventually price itself out of the market. So I, I think we should help that along. We should make corruption 
more expensive for the people who are corrupt in Russia. I don't think we're going to get rid of it, and that's, I think that's a fool, that fool's errand. But the, if we make the people who are part of the problem, if we basically tax them more, there'll, there'll be less corruption. I, I, think that's, I, I think that's just an objective fact. Right now, the way we treat it is we go from zero to 13. I, I think there's a role for sanctions, but that's kind of the death penalty. And there's an entire array of tools we could be using in the middle. And we don't have to start with har harming people. I mean, start with, they're, they're, Russia actually has a very aggressive and shouty anti-corruption, like Alexander Navalny. Just give him more PR coverage and make sure that more Russians see what he does, which is, he does a pretty darn good job of exposing corruption. Just help him. I think that PR is probably going to be one of our most effective tools. And if we get to the point where we have to sanction people, well, then fine, we sanction people. You know, the other reason why Schleifer is famous is because he went to jail for insider trading. But, <laughs> yeah, but and his wife. Uh, but, you know, a smart guy, mostly. And what, what was the other part? Uh, or did I mash it all into one? But that, I mean, that, that, I guess, is my main point is we, I, Right now, we hear Russia, 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 and then we go build five aircraft carriers. Aircraft carrier is, hammer, is a hammer. It's when you're a hammer, you see an eagle type of approach to, to fighting Russia. And it's, an aircraft carrier is not going to do anything to Russia right now. I mean, yeah, we could take it over, but we could take it over with one, and there, there's no point. Nobody wants to do that. It would be expensive, among other things. But we should instead, instead of spending $33 billion on new ships and whatnot, we should be spending $1 billion on, no, on anti-corruption measures and that type of stuff. It's way cheaper and it'll, it'll be way more effective, but I just, we're not there yet. Is there anyone else? Ma'am? Uh, hey, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, but everyone else? Typically, Russia is playing the other. If, if by, by helping calm things down, you mean getting Russia to quit pouring gasoline on the fire, then yes. I mean, there's one right now in Syria. Well, but well, I, I remember, uh, if I remember my studies correctly, there was quite a bit of impassion when diplomacy going on between Russia and Moscow. Right. And, and there was a lot with Cuba, and I mean, that, that's what Russia's play is to, that's how they remain relevant. Now the other, the corollary to that is they, they fund the problem, not always, but sometimes. If they funded the PKK in Turkey, they funded um, Arafat, they funded all kinds of bad people that most of the West was not happy with, we'll say. They funded the Tamil Tigers. And when the Soviet Union ended, the, there was a huge trove of stuff and it was, so bad, the people they funded, I don't think there is, even yet, 30 years later, it sunk in quite what they were doing. But now, I don't, I don't think that we're going to kick uh, Rush off the UN Security Council. I, I once mentioned that to John Bolton when he and I were in the State Department together, and he took him about a week to talk to me again, because he had spent so much effort uh, reforming stuff that he was trying to do inside the UN. It, it would just mess up a lot of stuff. You but, should write a Bolton, well done. <laughs> But, you know, one, one of the things, when, when the Soviet Union ended, Russia inherited a lot of uh, the seats that the Soviet Union used to have. And if I remember correctly, not only did the Soviets have a seat on the Security Council, but, but the various republics also had a rotating seat as well, or I don't remember how the mechanism worked. That went away, but Russia, Russia just inherited all the Soviet Union stuff. So not only that, but CFE treaty, all, all, INF treaty, everything that involved not just Russia, but all the other what, 13 republics, all those republics got excluded and, and Russia took, um, inherited those. Even if we just started asking that question, Putin will go bananas. Now, I don't think anything actually will become of it, but I mean, the goal here is to make Putin back down without having to shoot people, which I think is silly and necessary. But there are very simple ways that people could remember 
if people would think why things are happening in Russia, why Putin uses corruption in the way he does, why he says things he does, he's, I think he's actually a pretty easy, uh, empty tiger that we can take apart. He's not going to like hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is, we have time for, I think, two more questions. So, sir? Uh, yeah, I was very interested um, to hear Mr. Harrison sort of uh, optimistic view that eventually the Russian people will throw out Putin, but um, more, a little bit more than 50% of the people in Russia are between the ages of 15 and 54, according to the CIA World Factbook, if the journalist is still here is where I'm getting my facts from. And what I've also noticed is there, and this isn't just in Russia, but it's kind of a global issue, is strong nativism, that you know, part of Putin's yarn is, you know, about promoting the bare Russian culture vis-a-vis -vis Western culture, and that Western culture is a threat to Russian culture. So how will the Russian people, who are now somewhat being indoctrinated, almost the majority, um, walk away from that? Because a lot of them don't know what it was like before 1990. Um, you know, how, how's that going to work? Well, I mean, the short answer is messily. The, you know, I had a very bizarre question. I was in Kiev with a Jewish friend of mine. His twin brother was living in St. Petersburg, and he and I were at dinner, and his twin brother called from St. Petersburg and yelled at him for supporting Ukrainian Nazis. It was a very bizarre moment. But to your point, yeah, there's been a lot of indoctrination that's going on, and there's going to have to be... I, I don't want to use the word re-education because that's a loaded term for obvious reasons, but, I mean, you have people in Russia that say Stalin was good and that he supported the Orthodox Church and all kinds of crazy, batty nonsense. But it's because they're in a constant drip of propaganda. I, not that I think they're just going to revert to the norms once that propaganda goes away, but the flip side of this argument is, yes, those people don't remember how awful things went into the Soviet Union, but the Russians are not giving up their internet. They're not going to get rid of their cell phones. And for Putin to the logical end of what Putin wants, he's going to have to go down that path. And he's going to hit a much firmer resistance than I think he's expecting. And if things collapse, that internet's not going away. Because, not because we devised some system that can't be destroyed, although that's probably the case, but because Russians like that stuff. And, and Putin may not, but the most, most of the Russians do. And they like being able to talk with their neighbors and discuss that. The Russians are a very debate-oriented society. The Russians love debating, so much so that it drove me crazy when I lived there. But they, I, they're, I found them to be a very open people and very, you know, culture is very important, being able to debate how the ballet was. And they do that stuff on the internet now. And if the regime collapsed, Putin died of old age or whatever, that's not gonna go away. So those, those tools are gonna be there to reach those people. Not that we're going to be able to do it in a day. It's going to be one of those things that we have to figure out when the moment presents itself to us, which is how this always works. But, and it, it'll be messy, but it's not hopeless by any stretch of the imagination. All right, I think we have time for one more, sir. Yeah, th thank you very, very much indeed. Um, very interesting. Just a follow-up question, really, from what was said, or follow-up point from what was said just now. Uh, it sounds, and I apologize for this, like a naked advertisement for the English legal profession. Um, and I speak as a litigator in England, uh, doing a good deal of Russian litigation. It's quite interesting that notwithstanding all the geopolitical issues that one sees on the front pages and in the media day in, day out, Russians still invest very significantly in London. Many international legal contracts are governed by English law. And most importantly for many of the people in this room, they're litigated in London and so long may it continue. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, uh, notwithstanding how it's expressed in the media, there is a firm commitment to the rule of law. And indeed, one of the issues that will be before the English Commercial Court very soon is whether one will be able to enforce, at least in theory, an interlocutory worldwide freezing order granted by the High Court in England last July 2018 in Russia on the basis of international uh, comity. And it looks like there is Russian, Russian legal authority that will make that possible. So I just say that as a little bit of an advertisement for the legal profession. Uh, as a British citizen, I, uh, I, I wholly uh, uh, endorse that that statement, and, you know, and I, I, I think it's true. And I, I think there's a reason why why you know British courts and, and also why British Crown dependencies outside of the tax haven benefits, but why those courts are also trusted as well. And it's a uh, um, what can I say? Two thousand years of civilization. Go. 
one, one final comment, I would just, uh, just, I don't want to try to rebut or get a last word, but I would just say that the, the other thing that we should remember about Russia and when we talk about the Russian people is that if you're Russian right now, your, your chances are that you live better than anyone else has in the history of your country. You have better access to education, to food, to, to whatever than anyone has in the past. Um, and that reason is the same why people say, well, why, why, why might Trump get elected in America? Well, the economy is doing really well. Um, so I think we need to remember that and not portray Russia as sort of a land of radioactive suffering, um, which is sometimes how it, how it is. So thank you very much. I think we're out of time. I really appreciate everyone's patience, uh, everyone's calm, uh, and thank you.